people who don't know who we are, um, Rogers Ready. Rogers Ready is uh, the only truly national um, insolvency and turnaround firm in Australia that has offices in all states and territories. We're, we're a truly national firm in that respect. Um, and we have uh, over 100 staff and uh, we, you know, we're close to uh, we're over 30 partners around Australia and Australasia. And we're part of the BTG Global Advisory um, Association, which is with other insolvency firms around the world. Now, 2020, as we've sort of alluded um, over our last couple of presentations, has, uh, has been quiet in respect to formal insolvencies. Um, and Neil McLean, um, one of our partners, will talk about that later on. Um, but with formal insolvency being a bit quiet, it has op opened opportunities with our um, sister firm, um, which is Trafalgar Business Advisory, in respect to turnaround. And we've seen an, a number of successful turnarounds that we've been involved in in the latter part of this year. One being CS Logistics, which is a large um, national Australian logistics um, and warehousing company um, with a parent in Hong Kong. With the help of Rogers Reedy and Trafalgar Business Advisory, uh, we've seen the sale of um, the businesses um, that that um, company operates. Um, and we've seen a return to creditors of 100 cents in the dollar. It's been a great success. That's just one of the successes that we've had this year. Now for the people in Victoria and for people watching, we're finally in the, back in the office, um, which is great because most of the presentations this year have been held at people's homes. Um, so no jokes about kids walking in the background and cats walking in front of the screen. Um, we're actually in the office. So it's, we're excited to be, be back. Now this is the last presentation for 2020. We have a, a number set for um, the start of next year and we'll start very early next year with some great presentations lined up um, that we've already foreseen. Uh, we have over 200 people attending today. So once again, great numbers um, attending. So we're excited by that. Today's presentation, um, the, the flavor about it is uh, 2021 uh, and beyond and the impacts and the opportunities for property, uh, which we'll have Paul Sutherland from Sutherland Farrelly speak to us on, uh, employment issues, uh, which we'll have Neil Salvador um, speak to us from the NS8 group. Um, who is a lawyer and, and, and an expert in uh, employment um, law issues. And then we, we have basically Neil McLean, a partner of our Melbourne firm, talking about the insolvency issues and um, that will arise in early to mid um, next year. So that's the flavour of it. Let's talk about the presenters. Um, excited by the three that we have here. Neil Salvador is going to speak about return to work and employment issues. Um, Neil is a lawyer, he's an employment law expert and uh, a managing director of NS8 Group. Um, he has real life experience in respect to uh, the work that he does in, um, with employment law. He's worked big organisations such as Toll um, and um, he's heavily involved in very complex employment issues and safety matters um, around um, Australia. Um, and he's currently a lecturer at RMIT. So we'll have Neil speak to us shortly. Our second speaker who I've known for um, some time, um, and that is Paul Sutherland, who is a director of South Sutherland Farrelly, um, uh, very well respected name in the real estate space. Uh, over 40 years that Sutherland Farrelly have, has uh, have been an organization and uh, the directors there are, are the best. Um, and we're blessed to have Paul attend today. Paul is an accomplished auctioneer. Um, he has you know, diverse experience in, in all real estate um, and uh, at various points of time, he's been uh, involved in the Real Estate Institute of Victoria as um, president and director on that board. So he's well respected, over 30 years of experience. Um, and I know that we go to Paul often with our, um, our property issues on our matters Following um, Paul, we'll have Neil McLean, who, um, who will talk about the stress in 2021. Neil McLean is uh, a director of Rogers Reedy Melbourne. Um, he has over 20 years of experience um, working with stakeholders uh, in insolvency and the reconstruction industry. Um, and Neil is a bankruptcy trustee and a registered liquidator. So we're um, thankful that we've got Neil here today. Very good. 
Well, let's go to um, the first person we would like to speak to, um, which is uh, Neil Salvador. And, and Neil, good afternoon, Neil. Thank you for attending. Um, and uh, blessed to have you. What does 2021 hold for, for businesses around Australia in, in respect to employment? Well, we'd love to hear what, uh, what you have to say on that, Ed. Well, thank you, Brent, and, and thank you for that terrific introduction too. Uh, I'm happy for you to keep talking about me for as long as you like. Uh, so thank you. As you've, as you've mentioned, I have to say, Brent, it has been an incredible year in terms of employment and safety law. Uh, while there's been so many issues for many, many people around Australia and also around the world, we need to brace ourselves for what's likely to take place in 2021. So I hope that for the next 10 minutes, I can give some insight about certainly what my views are, what the, what the law says in terms of the interactions between the legal requirements and the practical requirements, because that's the reality that we need to deal with. So what I hope to do for the next 10 minutes is to just give you an insight about the laws so the context about those laws, the conflict that that might create, and more importantly, how employers and businesses need to brace themselves to deal with what may be ahead for us. Next slide, thank you. So our next slide is about key legal sources. So predominantly, uh, for those that are familiar with these, with these acts, I, uh, I apologise, but I just want to give some insight about this and what this means. So firstly, for Victoria, there's the Public Health and Wellbeing Act of 2008, and that's the act, that is the primary act that has provided uh, the government, the Chief Health Officer and uh, the Premier Daniel Andrews with the ability to shape requirements and restrictions and therefore provide us with timing as to when these changes are likely to take place. For many of you, you're probably familiar with uh, early in September, the state government, Daniel Andrews, proposed that he wanted to have an 18 month extension uh, to the emergency powers. Uh, at parliament, uh, that sitting that very evening, uh, it was granted for six months from the 8th of September, which means this is going to be, at the very least, the requirements and the restrictions that we have in place, even though they may be eased as time goes on, there is some legal authority up until the end of that six month period. So employers need to be very, very mindful about that. As employees return to work, employers must ensure that they are across the key obligations that exist, not just within the Fair Work Act. And some of that decision-making is around adverse action, redundancies, how you deal with performance management, but importantly, the OHS Act. And the OHS Act gives guidance and expectations about creating a safe work environment. Another key part of the OHS Act is uh, is an amendment to the OHS regulations. Now that provided some insight for, for all of us in terms of uh, lawyers and particularly safety. Uh, what that means is that if there is anyone in the business, uh, whether that person is an employee, a visitor or a contractor who is found to have been uh, COVID positive during the infectious period, there is an obligation, a legal obligation, in fact, to notify WorkSafe, that is WorkSafe in Victoria, within 48 hours of, uh, of finding that information out. And a fact to do that can lead to significant fines uh, up to around $200,000. So employers need to be across that and need to understand what their obligations are from a safety side. Next slide. So again, as I mentioned at the outset, there's some intersecting acts of parliament that employers must absolutely be aware of. And it's important for employers to be aware of these matters because often it's when heat of the moment discussions take place with employees who, who 
either don't want to return to work or feel the environment is unsafe to return to work. And these situations happened. We've, we've fielded many, many calls from our clients about these particular scenarios. And employers need to be aware that whilst the pandemic and this situation is still in front of us, there are legal obligations that must be complied with. And they are matters within the Fair Work Act. And they include uh, matters such as redundancy obligations, adverse action obligations, and unfair dismissals. The Fair Work Commission released a report, uh, a, a financial year report, a, a financial 20 year report, which stated there was a 43% increase in unfair dismissals between March and June of 2020. A lot of those matters were related to COVID and it was related to, to uh, employers handling uh, individuals and, and people in ways that were deemed to have been outside uh, the parameters of the Fair Work Act. So again, it's, it's, it's very important to understand that whilst employers are dealing with various difficult situations, not just with revenue, but also with cost, there are ways, legal ways, in which employees need to be dealt with. The other very important act that employees need to be mindful of is the OHS Act. And that requires employers to provide a working environment that is uh, as free uh, uh, from the risks of injury as far as reasonably practicable. That requires a lot of work. It requires effort and it requires employers to undertake a number of different practices. For the next slide, please. Some of those practices that employers really do need to think about and be mindful about are matters like having COVID safe plans in place. There are six principles that are fairly consistent throughout Australia, no matter where you uh, operate from, that are the same. And that is the application of the basic things that we've constantly heard about. And that involves the attendance registers. It's about all those issues that employers embark upon to make sure that their environment is as safe as they possibly can. And how do you achieve that? You achieve that by having appropriate policies in place, making sure that you have COVID related systems and practices in place, making sure that your people in your business understand what those practices are, making sure that they understand that you have done everything you possibly can to minimize risk. It is the reinforcement of, of policies like bullying and harassment Again, it's very important that employers have these systems in place and constantly communicate these policies to all their employees. Importantly, as I said at the outset, it's important that managers and supervisors when dealing with difficult situations are aware of what their obligations are and how to deal with issues. When you have individuals that say, right at that moment, I don't feel safe about returning work and therefore I'm not coming back to work. Our employers deal with that situation at that very first opportunity then determines the next course of action. So it's important that businesses have adequate training and systems in place for their supervisors and managers to deal with these situations. Need to be aware of adverse action. For those that are not familiar with that term, it is treating someone adversely if they bring forward a workplace right. And a workplace right could be as simple as saying, I don't feel safe about this environment and therefore I'm not returning to work. If not handled correctly, it may well lead to an adverse action claim. So again, the key point there is making sure that supervisors and managers are aware of how to deal with these particular situations. My last three or four points on this slide is about employment contracts, policies and safety action plans and training. I just wanna talk specifically about employment contracts. Employment contracts are a very critical part of the employment relationship because 
it provides a platform for that relation to exist and to exist in a very coherent fashion. Employment policies, however, are policies, are systems and processes that employers can amend and put in place as required to meet the needs of the business with a level of speed. The difference with changing the employment contract is that you must appoint both parties, whereas employment policies, it is very much at the will of the employer to be able to change direction and change processes with little or no interaction whatsoever with employees. Safety action plans, again, must include uh, matters related to COVID. Uh, I know that the uh, financial 20 financial year uh, report from WorkSafe stated that there was 3,105 workplace inspections undertaken by WorkSafe inspectors related specifically to COVID. So again, the COVID situation, the legal obligations and we know that because we have laws in place certainly up until the 28th of July 2021 in terms of incident notifications. We have the emergency powers. So there, there are legal obligations that employers must be aware of. And I know that we've tried to cover a lot in a short period of time, uh, but we say to you that if you are unsure please feel free to make contact with, with Brent, the Rogers Reed Group or NSA Group and we'd be more than happy to help. Right. Neil, that's, that's amazing. I mean, that's um, just the, the level um, of involvement and I mean, it's just, just to be all over the law just shows you need advisors in this space. I come back to the, the fact which you know we've we're back in the office now at Rogers Ready in, in Victoria and, and have you know we've implemented all the, the various um, matters that you've raised. What what if what happens if a staff member um, says basically I, I don't want to come back in, uh, you know, I'm not coming back in, I'm um, for whatever yes. reason, but say says that oh, no, I'm I'm happy working at home, um, I'm worried about transport. Or, or maybe they don't sort of detail, but they're saying, no, no, I'm going to work from home and they're not going to come back in. What do we do? Yes. So it's a great question. So what, what that means is we, we need to default back to the employment contract. And the, the employment contract should specify the terms and conditions of employment. If people, and we know that people working from home, that was a variation to the original employment contract. So when we have situations, where people decide that they're not going to return to work, yet the business has done everything they possibly can to keep the environment safe, then we need to pursue actions such as not following a reasonable direction. And that means that there must be evidence that there are policies in place to deal with COVID. So once we have complied with those obligations by having those policies in place, once we've communicated those policies in place, and once we feel satisfied that we have met our obligation, if an employee refuses to follow that reasonable direction, then we need to look at a performance management process. And that's why employment contracts, Brent, a very important part of not just this process, but ongoing employment relationship between both parties. Right, excellent. Um, does that help? Yeah, it does. And, and what about once you get them here and they're working? As an employee, do you have to do anything different as what you were sort of doing a yeah, year ago? Yes, yes, yes. So you absolutely, you need to communicate what you've done. So you need to communicate that you've provided a safe working environment and that should be captured in, a, in some kind of COVID policy about a reporting policy. So it's captured quite neatly in a policy that has been communicated, that has been understood. And there should be evidence that that has been uh, communicated to all parties and acknowledged by all parties. Absolutely important to do, Brent. Fantastic, Neil. Thank you, Neil.
short Thank and you. sharp. I'm sorry. We we could talk about this for the whole amount of time. There's no doubt about it. Um, it's I'm sorry. Be I'm I'm sorry. I've taken so much time. No, 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 no. Not at all. It's um. It, it's going to be. It, all business owners are going to be um, need to be right across this, and and if they're not, um, you know, you need to be contacting Neil at uh, N8 Group and and really seeking direction about what to do because it's um it's a perilous um, position you put yourself in if you don't get it right. So Neil, thank you very much for thank your you. presence thank today. You. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Um, moving on to a completely different topic um, and very interesting for, for a lot of people is what the property market is going to do in uh, 2021. Um, there's been lots of people suggesting different ways it's going to go um, and looking for opportunities, maybe pitfalls, so why not um, speak to an expert who sees it every day and has been um, seeing it for over 30 years? Um, Paul, how are you? Paul Sutherland from Sutherland Farrelly. Good afternoon. Hi, Brent. How are you? Very good. Very good. And any, um, some opportunities for us in 2021 or? Yeah, yeah, I think there will be opportunities. It's just trying to work out what they are and which one's the, the right one and which, which are the wrong ones. But before I start talking about opportunities, I'd just like to run through, if I can, just maybe some of the drivers in respect of the property market, because I think they're going to tell you where you should go. And I think one of the main drivers is interest rates. And as everyone's probably aware, the current RBA interest rates 0.1%, which is the lowest it's ever been. Um, variable rates are probably home loan rates, probably you know two percent to three point seven five percent. Fixed rates one point nine to three point five, which are very attractive rates. When I think back to my first home loan, which was seventeen percent, quite a bit of a difference. So interest rates will be a key driver. My gut feel is interest rates are, are going to be long for a long time. Um, so there's an opportunity there. With, it, with with borrowing funds, but whether it's available, depending on what your project is. The other driver is going to be unemployment. Current unemployment for the ABS is saying 7%, but I think there's a lot of underemployment. And the key question is, what's going to happen when JobKeeper is no longer there? And that unemployment will determine a little bit the strength of the real estate market. The other thing that's fueling property real estate at the moment is the government incentives. You've got JobKeeper number one, but you've also got now the Home Builder Grant. You've got the state government with land tax relief and also stamp duty relief. They'll continue to be there and they'll help fuel the property market. There's also been rent relief for residential and commercial. And it's only in the last couple of days that the Victorian government's extended the commercial rent relief scheme until the 28th of March next year. So there's a few landlords who are not happy and there's a few retailers and other tenants who probably are happy. I don't know that it was the wisest choice to, to extend it, but it's taken place. You know, what happens to a few landlords, it's now 12 months they've provided rent relief. Um, so it's a pretty significant impost on landlords across the board. One of the biggest drivers in Victoria has been immigration. And I've said to people before, it was the hero and now it's zero. And we need it back for our economy and for the property economy. The question is how we do it and how quickly it comes back. I think the government should bite the bullet and create quarantine centres in regional locations and start immigration as soon as possible and spend some money on that infrastructure and not just on other wasted infrastructure, but time will tell as to what they do. The other one, of course, is overseas students. Again, our economy needs them. The CBD needs them to fill some of these apartments. When that may occur, I don't know. When the Chinese government say you can go back to Australia, who knows? Tourism, another bit of a driver in Victoria, maybe not as significant as in Queensland, Currently, it's the local people who are fueling the, the tourism in Victoria, but slowly that will change as people become more comfortable with flying and travelling within Australia and then eventually overseas. But that might be one or two years away. Who knows? It depends what happens with the vaccine and so on. Another key driver with 
real estate and property is the availability of funds. It's fine to talk about cheap money and low interest rates, but you've still got to be, act, be able to access the funds. So it's whether the ma four majors are lending, whether the second or third tier lenders, what they're, what they're lending at and really the availability. So that's my sort of opinion of the drivers of the property sector. And there's a lot of uncertainty with the Chinese government and their attitude with tariffs. Also, what we do with immigration, what we do with, with foreign students. So there's a few uncertainties there, but I think it'll play out over the next three or four months. The question really with the economy and the Chinese government too is whether we stand up to the government, Chinese government, or whether we bow. Uh, I think we should stand up and take a little bit of pain, but who knows what's gonna happen long-term. Now, if I move to the property sectors, and quickly running through it, really you've got residential, your own home. I think prices have held up and increased due to a lack of supply. I think you'll see a lot more people renovate their home because they're not going to be doing the overseas trip. So there might be a bit more renovation happening and people stay where they are, which might again put a cap on supply and that'll help keep property prices up. Again, unemployment, a key driver in this area and also immigration to a point. But maybe there's an opportunity there. The outer suburbs with new subdivisions, they're being fueled by a lot of those incentives and the home, first homeowners are back. And, but the real beneficiary of that will be the developers. They'll benefit from that. The, the first homeowners are desperate to get in, cheap money, a lot of incentives for them, but it's the developers of those estates that'll benefit, not necessarily the wider community, but you might get some spill on into, into the second homeowner market. Holiday homes, I think a lot of people have turned around and said, well, I can't go overseas, so I'm gonna buy a holiday home. And you've seen prices increase dramatically and supply reduced. I think that'll continue for a while until people say they're comfortable to travel overseas. And when you look at overseas and the, the COVID situation, you, you're probably not that comfortable to do that in the foreseeable future. Regional, a little bit like holiday homes. Everyone says, I don't have to work in the office anymore. I can go and buy in the, in the country and I can go and live in the country. And that's fueled that market. Prices have increased dramatically. There's not enough supply. All the agents I talk to just say they've had a fantastic year um, selling regional properties. It'll just be interesting to see that all the people who have done it whether they stay or whether they say, mm, maybe not all the facilities are here in the regions, let's go back to the city where we've got everything. So that'll play out a little bit. But some of those opportunities like that may have already passed as in the prices have increased so much. Apartments, I think the, with apartments, it's a little bit as to whether you're good quality owner-occupier build or whether you're investor grade. And the owner-occupier quality will probably stand up. The investor grade is down at the moment. Not enough tenants and not enough buyers. We've heard talk of some investors starting to come back, probably fueled by the incentives and the low interest rates. But I think it's too early to know. The thing that will help apartments is the lack of new build, which will probably underpin the current supply. Is there an opportunity? Maybe. Um, but I wouldn't be rushing in to buy 10 apartments if I was you. The other new sector is the build to rent that everyone keeps talking about that's never been feasible in Australia due to our low, the, the low returns on residential. But everyone's talking about it now that it can work because of the level of interest rates. I'm still to see it um, in this country. I know it's in a lot of other countries and it works really well. It'll be interesting to see what happens in Australia with the build to rent. The office sector, an interesting area. Um, as Brent said, we're only now back in the offices and certainly not everyone's back. Um, we're sort of thinking that a third of people want to stay at home and work at home. A third will want to get back into the office and the other third will want to do a bit of both. The question mark is what densities we end up with in offices and as to whether there's going to be oversupply or whether it will balance out. I'm thinking that the CBDs will struggle for a while, but the outer suburbs will probably be okay, or the middle and outer suburbs be okay, because there's less density and people will feel more comfortable.
but whether there's an opportunity, maybe there's opportunities in the in the not within the CBD, um, but it'll play that'll play out over time. Retail, another sector that has been belted, in my opinion. I think the pandemic and being at home has accelerated online shopping by three, four, or five years, and the bricks and mortar retail is what's suffering. Um, there's pressure on rents with the rent relief schemes in place. There's, there's pressure there, but there's going to be an ongoing pressure where rents will have reduced and will continue to be flat. There'll be more and more vacancies where retailers just say, I can't make money. I can't compete. And you're even seeing it with Amaya and David Jones that I think have got a limited future. So retail's really under pressure. And I think if there's an opportunity there, it may be an opportunity to buy or look at fringe retail that can be repurposed whether it becomes home office, whether it becomes straight residential or alternative type uses, because I think generally we've got too much retail. The industrial market, another sector that's been the darling through the pandemic, everyone wants industrial now, um, particularly investors. Um, you've seen yields dr dr dramatically reduce. There's significant from de demand there and you've seen prices increase rents growing a little bit but now rents are nowhere near the level of rents in sydney or in brisbane due to our abundance of flat industrial land but there's a little bit of growth there i think industrial will stay strong for a long time um, and, and with interest rates where they are You've got yields that have compressed in from, you know, six and a half, seven, seven and a half to now five, five and a half. That'll be here for a long time. Investment real estate, generally, there's a lot of money in the system trying to find a home. It doesn't want to sit in a term deposit. It's uncertain with the stock market. They're ploughing it into real estate and yields just keep coming down, particularly when agents are marketing properties as, you know, uh, emergency services or like child care and all this, then the yields just keep dropping. Um, whether there's opportunities, you just got to be careful as to whether you end up buying at the peak or, or, or you still have that opportunity to see further growth. And it depends on the industry, depends on the real estate. Hospitality, I think, is an industry that will be under pressure for a while. I think more and more people we won't go out as much. We've all learned how to eat at home. And not that we're going to do it all the time, but maybe we won't all rush back into hospitality like we used to. And I think hospitality is an area where, it'll, to me, it'll take a long time for confidence to come back, for us to stand at the bar shoulder to shoulder, spilling beer on each other, to be confident with that for the whole population. Some people don't care, but other people are still cautious and I think that'll take a long time to unfold and a lot of restaurants will struggle in the, in the short term if, if they and they would have struggled already but whether they can come out of it when all the relief is is gone is questionable. Development sites uh, are, are an opportunity but a riskier opportunity. I think there's not the development taking place at the moment. Maybe there's sites that an opportunity to buy now and maybe in time when people want to come back to Australia because we're a safe, a safe country and done really well with COVID, um, there'll be an opportunity, but you'll have to be patient. And it depends what development site. Like if you're talking offices, I'd steer clear. If you're talking residential, it will come back because we have a long-term undersupply of, of uh, residential real estate in Australia. And that's, that's why we have the unaffordability problem. That will change potentially over time. The other question for the whole economy that affects the property, as I said before, is China and the tariffs and what they do and what we do. It's just going to create uncertainty and different sectors are going to get hurt. Um, you know, we need China, but we shouldn't need, we don't need them at all, you know, to forego everything. Um, we need their tourism, we need their money, but we've still got to stand up as well. I mentioned before that we've done really well with COVID. We had a hiccup in Victoria, of course, but we've done well. I think that sets us up for a really bright future in some regards for whether it's tourism 
or whether it's immigration, that people will want to be here. Um, I think it will strengthen our country long term as a place to be. And, and that's going to benefit the whole economy and property. Um, the other one is the vaccine. It's being tested in the UK. Trump, Donald Trump's kind enough to have produced his for us. He's such a genius. Um, you can access the Russian one if you, if you want to try. Um, let's, we can all wait a little bit longer to see who suffers and who doesn't. But I think hopefully by mid-year, um, we're all in a safer place. We're all more confident that we can move forward. Um, so that's probably my little summary of the drivers of, of the property sector and also maybe some of the opportunities. I think there will be opportunities. You just got to be a little bit cautious. Thanks, Paul. Um, what about uh, safe opportunities? Are there, if, you, if you want to uh, find an investment that you, you would consider safe, well, are there, what, what areas would you consider? Well, like your own home is a safe investment and it's also a tax effective investment. Um, so whether you choose to renovate to, to, to for your own home or whether you upgrade, I think that's a safe investment. You're only little downside. There's not a lot of supply, so prices are being held up a little bit. But that's probably your safe, long-term, tax-effective investment. Yeah, and what about high-risk opportunities? Are there other ones that you could sort of highlight as? Well, high risk are probably development sites. Are they right? Um, cool. That's probably the, your high risk, but the high reward, depending on how you're trying to read the future. Like I think we'll be in a better place in two years. It's whether we've got the courage to commit and say that's a that's a site that no one really wants now, but in time that'll come back. Um, but there's still developers out there who can access funds, who will will, will buy. But we like we've just sold a partly completed project, apartment project, and that was hard work. And the develop a lot of the developers with the money are being very hard on price. So. Yep. Whether that eases as, as people get more confident, maybe it will. Paul, thank you. That, um, that was amazing. Um, a great overview of uh, property in Australia and, and what we're going to see in um, 2021. Thank you. Um, my pleasure. I'll send you my money. You can go and invest it for me, please. No, don't give it to me. I'm a real estate agent. <laughs> <laughs> uh, wrong, wrong person. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> Um, no and uh, once again, uh, Sutherland Farrelly, very well respected um, name in um, in real estate in Victoria. Um, so if uh, if you want to go and speak to the Pauls and the, and the Grants there and the other directors, um, you, you should contact them directly on their website. So thank you, Paul, for your, your time today. No problem. Excellent. Our final speaker um, is uh, Neil McLean, um, fellow director of Rogers Reedy Melbourne. He, um, he has been with Rogers Reedy for a number of years, as I said, uh, insolvency practitioner specialising in corporate and personal insolvency. He's going to talk about today um, about in the insolvency landscape in 2021. Neil, good afternoon to you. Um, thanks for attending today. What's happening? What's going to happen? Good afternoon, Brent, and then thanks for the opportunity. Um, and thank you to all of our attendees for coming along today. Great turnout, um, having 200 plus. Um, where I thought I'd probably start is just really a, a quick recap on the insolvency relief that's been put in place as a result of COVID. So back in March, the government quickly put um, some measures in place to try and protect businesses um, from insolvency. Um, and largely those uh, protections have assisted and, and uh, enabled businesses to essentially hibernate through this really difficult period. Um, some of the, the um, relief that was put in place was an extension in terms of uh, the time to comply with a statutory demand or a bankruptcy notice. Ordinarily, that was 21 days, which was pushed out to six months. So again, giving um, debtors a bit more breathing room to, to deal with their financial distress. Um, and in addition to that, the, the amount upon which you could issue a stat demand um, or a bankruptcy notices, bankruptcy notice rather, was increased to $20,000, uh, up from $2,000 for a corporate entity and up from $5,000 uh, for an individual. So those uh, assistance, the assistance packages really, really uh, help businesses um, avoid having to go into an insolvent um, um, regime. Um, and in addition, the government put in some protection in relation to, to directors um, 
relief in terms of insolvent trading. So if the director was incurring debt during this period, um, in the ordinary course of its business, then it could have a defence against any insolvent trading claim that might be brought by a liquidator later on. So those um, assistance packages, along with um, the other ones, such as the JobKeeper, and as Paul mentioned, in terms of the relief from, from landlords, um, really have assisted viable businesses to make it through and start to come out the other side. Now we're sort of coming out of our lockdowns, um, particularly in Victoria. There has, however, been some un unintended consequences. Um, and you may have heard in the news and the reports and on LinkedIn, um, talking about zombie companies. Um, ordinarily, um, per annum, there's about 8,000 companies that are wound up. Um, and during this period um, of COVID, since pretty much since March, uh, there's very been very few wind-ups uh, as a result of the, the relief that's been put in place. Um, what that sort of means is that there's been a lot of companies that should have gone into liquidation or sort of should, some form of external administration that haven't, um, and are just surviving off JobKeeper and the like um, to, to keep ticking along. Um, all things that are good must come to an end. So this, the relief that's in place at the moment um, in relation to the set demands and the creditor enforcement and also the insolvency relief is coming to an end as of the 31st of December this year. Um, it's a key point to note that in relation to the insolvent trading um, relief for directors, that um, the way the legislation has been drafted, and there's a couple of different views on this, but 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 our, our position or my position is, is that the way the legislation has been drafted is that the defence to an insolvent trading claim as uh, under the relief mechanism uh, will only be available to a, a director that places their company into external administration by 31 December. So if they if they placed into external administration on 2nd of January, for instance, um, then they may not have the the that, that protection afforded to them in relation to an insolvent trading claim. Um, and I expect that that's going to be something that would be tested through the courts uh, in due course. Um, as a result of this uh, enforcement um, relief being lifted, um, we do expect there's going to be a, a significant spike in, in statutory demands and bankruptcy notices. I've been speaking with a number of, of debt collection agencies and lawyers uh, around town and, and they've sort of got them stacked up ready to go um, come 1 January. So um, there'll be obviously a bit of a delay with the court process um, and, and actually having the stat demands expire and so forth. Um, but we do expect to see that bit of a spike in insolvency matters uh, come on somewhere between sort of February, March, April or thereabouts. <clears throat> um, the government, however, has um, in an effort to try and assist businesses um, to restructure and, 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 um, and keep their businesses going, um, introduced significant changes to the insolvency laws, um, which have just recently passed in, in, in federal parliament. Um, those changes are to commence on 1 January. Um, and essentially the, the key issues um, that the legislation deals with is what's called a small business restructure and also a streamlined liquidation. Uh, if you attended our last um, webinar um, where we had USA versus Australia in Chapter 11 versus a small business restructure, um, you would have heard Andrew Barnden of our New South Wales office, um, one of our partners there, um, going into a fair bit of detail around the um, um, processes that were uh, proposed in relation to that small business restructure. Um, just to touch on that really quickly, um, the, the small business re restructure is um, uh, you're only eligible to, to enter that, that regime if you've got $1 million of actual debts, and so not contingent debts or less. Uh, the tax lodgements must be up to date. The, the due employee entitlements that are due and payable must be paid. So if you've got accrued superannuation that hasn't been paid, that must be dealt with before you can enter into a small business restructure. Um, one of the key things, and this is where we talked about in our last webinar, is, is that it is a debtor in possession model. So the company enters into a restructure phase, um, the directors um, or owners of the business maintain control through that period. So unlike a voluntary administration where control is handed over to the administrator, the, the directors continue to trade through that period. That in itself, in my mind, poses a few, few issues, and I'll touch on that in, in, a, in a moment. Um, the purpose of this is, is, is to assist the, the SME market. Um, and what the government has introduced in the legislation is that the practitioner who's appointed will um, uh, indicate a fixed fee for actually undertaking this process. Um, so that'll be another interesting thing to see. Um, once the restructure process starts, the company and the practitioner develop a plan um, and they've got 20 business days to do that. There is the scope for a short extension um, if you satisfy certain criteria. Once that plan has been developed, that's issued to creditors and then creditors have 15, vote, 15, sorry, 15 days to vote on that uh, proposal. Um, <clears throat> 
one of the other key um, instances in relation to voting is that the related parties are, are, are excluded from voting. Um, so it, it um, avoids uh, creditors being stacked in, in, in those sort of deals being pushed through. Um, the other key difference to a voluntary administration is, is the plan is accepted by a majority in value, um, whereas a voluntary administration or a deed uh, is majority in value and number. Um, and one of the other um, key things that due to the, the, the way that the legislation has been rushed through, um, a, the company can declare its intention to restructure um, from the 1st of January. Um, if it publishes an advert on the ASIC's public notices website, um, is where we usually publish all our um, appointments in relation to insolvency appointments and so forth. If they do that, then they have um, the extension of the insolvent trading relief up until 31 March. Um, so if they do it on 1st of January, they've got a three month window. If they do it um, on the 1st of March, they've only got a 31 day window. The streamlined liquidation was the other key um, piece of legislation that has been introduced. Um, the issue with the streamlined liquidation or the, the purpose of the streamlined liquidation rather is um, to, to where there's a small, um, very simple company, um, reduce the investigative requirements and so forth um, to again, try and reduce costs for, for that market and get those assets, um, distressed assets recycled and back out, back out into the community, into the business community. Um, there has been um, an issue identified in the legislation in terms of um, the, the, the time periods in, in which the, the process needs to take place. Um, and the advice we've received is if a practitioner takes appointment as a liquidator for a streamlined liquidation, um, they will be breaking the law. So they'll be the breaking the legislation um, as a result of, of the way it's been drafted. Um, Arita um, has been very vocal on this um, and despite all the efforts um, from industry and particularly Arita, um, the, the, the legislation passed through Parliament unamended. So that'll obviously be a matter that the government will need to deal with um, in the new year. So what do <clears throat> companies do or, or businesses do in terms of, of if they're finding themselves in financial distress? Um, first and foremost, and what we do here at Rogers Reedy is, is look at opportunities for um, a restructure or a turnaround for the business. Um, we've got a sister entity, as Brent mentioned, Trafalgar Business Advisory, who specialises in, in that area, um, and which is a non-insolvency business. As soon as you hand a Rogers Reedy card, everyone knows Rogers Reedy as an insolvency business and, and directors don't generally like to talk to liquidators. So what, what we try and do through that is, is work through potentially developing a safe harbour plan, um, uh, restructuring debt, um, looking to negotiate with financiers. Um, looking at potential additional income streams um, and then sort of over, overall looking for opportunities to develop growth. Um, I'm working on a matter at the moment um, where I'm assisting a, a business in the tourism industry um, and they've uh, run into really significant issues in terms of uh, their income going from about 12 to $14 million a year to, to zero overnight uh, as a result of COVID. So working through with them, developing a plan and assisting um, them to negotiate with their financiers in terms of, of getting through the other side. Uh, the formal alternatives, as most of you may have come across in the past, um, a voluntary administration um, is, is a great um, strategy in terms of if a restructure or informal process isn't going to work, um, and then a voluntary administration takes the, the, the control away from the director who may have got the company into that position. Um, and then the administrator can then conduct an investigation and work through what's in the best interest of creditors. There may be a proposal under a deed of company arrangement put up by either the directors, shareholders or a third party. Um, and the, the administrator will go through a process to assess whether creditors' interest would be best served by accepting that proposal um, or otherwise the liquidation of the company. Um, there's also a prospect in terms of a, a voluntary administration that would then lead to a liquidation if the business itself isn't viable. Um, that, that may also constitute or, or involve a sale of business, um, similar to, to what Brent mentioned earlier um, with the CS Logistics matter. However, that might went through a docker as well. Um, the small business restructure, which I've already mentioned, um, or alternatively, if, if the business isn't viable um, and it can't be restructured, then uh, liquidation and an orderly winding up of the company um, may be the most appropriate course of action. Uh, in liquidation, uh, employees would be entitled to um, make a claim against the fair entitlement guarantee so the, their employee entitlements can be dealt with. Um, and really, again, dealing with the realisation of those assets and selling those assets and, and getting them out and getting the best return for creditors. So that, that's pretty much a quick overview um, based on the time I, I sort of had. Um, just wanted to note that, yeah, both at Rogers Radio at all our offices um, around Australia, 
um, we definitely have the expertise and experience um, in relation to all the matters that I've talked about today. Um, and what we really aim to do is, is help um, struggling businesses that are in financial distress get through the other side um, so we can minimise the impact on all stakeholders, be that employees, business owners and creditors. Back to you, Brent. Thanks, Neil. Um, thank you. Uh, just before you go, I I'm interested to know what do you think is going to be the tipping point? What um, action is it going to be the uh, removal um, at the end of this year um, of the safeguards for insolvency? What, I mean, what's going to be the trigger point that's going to cause you know, lots of insolvencies, if, if at all? Yeah, I, I think I think um, once the relief uh, gets lifted as of 1 January, <clears throat> we're definitely going to see an uptick uh, in terms of collection and enforcement activity. Um, but for me, I think the key driver uh, in the insolvency sector is really the tax office. Um, at the, the tax office all the way through COVID has been um, softly, softly and, and working with businesses, unless it's in really egregious behaviour or fraudulent behaviour. Um, they're working with businesses in terms of payment plans or deferrals, those sort of things. Um, my view is at some point that's got to turn around. Um, the tax office can't um, uh, put off collecting its debts um, forever. And I think um, I read an article a couple of weeks ago where, the, where the, there's been a 20% increase in the, the outstanding tax liability to about $53.8 billion um, that, the, that the commissioner needs to collect. So uh, I think once that, the tax office takes off um, their softly, softly approach and, and starts to enforce, um, that's when we're really going to see pressure put on to, to directors and business owners to actually deal with their deal with their liabilities. Yes, yes. Re record numbers the ATO are holding on to at the moment. Neil, thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Um, it, it, it's uh, our final presentation for the year. Um, we've got you out within an hour, some good CPA hours. Thank you very much. Um, once again, um, I'll mirror what um, Neil has said, that if uh, yourself, your clients, uh, your customers have issues in the um, distress, financial distress space, please um, feel free to contact um, any of the trusted advisors at, um, at Rogers Ready nationally and, and also um, to our firms um, in Southeast Asia. Um, we, at the end of this, we, we've got uh, um, our new um, small business restructuring um, platforms, which there you go. Um, and they are our new um, uh, websites that will be coming online. And that is uh, basically highlighting um, our expertise um, in that SME turnaround space. Um, jump on the websites when they become live shortly. If you're an accountant and you have clients that uh, have financial distress, um, feel free to contact us, including lawyers as well. If you've got customers in that space, clients, um, or if you have clients that uh, that basically want to uh, wind up. That's uh, how we get involved. Um, we get involved with finances as well in respect to enforcement and, um, and, and reports for their customers. So if you fit in that sort of category, feel free to contact us. Thank you very much. We'll um, undoubtedly speak again in um, 2021. Um, safe uh, festive season and we'll see you all in the year. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. <laughs>